Welcome to The Point of View. This is your favorite current kind of affairs show on television. Here on The Point of View, we get the right guests. We ask them relevant questions on issues that matter to you. And hopefully you live with some insights. It's an interactive show. If you're watching on television, send us your thoughts on the WhatsApp number on the screen. And if you're watching on the social media platforms, feel free to get in touch in the stream. Well, it's manifesto season. And so today we're continuing. A couple of days ago, we had the NDC manifesto launch at the UPSA. We did the show till almost 11 p.m. Today we've pulled out one of the people who've been working on the manifesto to come and tell us what the NDC really wants to do, what is the economic plan, how different it is from what this government is doing, and hopefully we'll get some interesting insights. It's in the person of Kwame Iwadaku. We'll talk to him when I come back. Stay with us. Leave it to me how the kids last night. Congrats! Have you heard? Question me as two kids. Have you heard? My son has two kids. How was he? No, 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 no. No, yes, this is how I want to stop it. The missing ticket. Have you heard? Get free calls and free Airtel Tigo money transfers for six months on new Airtel Tigo Sims. Get a sim. <laughs> African Nacity is using plastic waste to provide affordable homes. I'm good to have you. Good evening. Thank you, Bernard. Good evening. When I interview the finance minister, I wear white, and he tells me it's because of Ecclesiastes. You are wearing black. What's going on? <laughs> it's one of my favorite colors. Is it? Yes. And that's interesting. <laughs> it brings out your fairness. <laughs> I'm not particularly fair. <laughs> what have you been up to? When I, when I advertised the show, mm -hmm. people were asking me what I was going to do with Zoom, because they didn't know you were in Ghana. Well, I've been back in Ghana for a while, really? um, since um, May, April 2019. Oh, wow, over a year ago? Over a year ago. How long were you out? I was out for about two and a half years. I wow. actually suffered an injury Okay. on my eye, and that's what took wow. me out. Oh, okay. So you've been back since April 2019? That is correct. You need to be lying low. Um, it depends. I've been paying attention to what's happening on the national scene, and I was also writing a book. Oh. So I've spent a lot of time oh. investing in my time in doing that, yes. Oh, okay. It's so called The African Apocalypse. How many pages? It's about 421 pages so far. Bigger than Ahoy book. <laughs> I'm not sure. I haven't read the Ahoy book. You should read it. It's amazing. I will. Wow. So what does a businessman turned politician gone into opposition do? Do you go back to business or do you stay with the politics? You do a bit of both because life is evolutionary. Okay. So you, I've always had some business interest every now and then. Mm. Um, but I think coming into politics, I became much more interested in the development challenge of Ghana and also for the continent. Mm. Um, and that was the thrust of my book, the, the challenges Africa has faced in its development and where we are to date. Wow, this is not Ghana, Africa. It's not Ghana. I would like to see. Is it ready? Is it out? It's ready, but it's not been published. Um, wow. Yeah. We did research in... I'll just give you one example from the book. We did research on 36 African countries, mm. just finding out what is going on in the media and what Africans are saying. Mm. And the results were very interesting. Wow. 45 to 55% of the media discourse in Africa is on politics. 45 to 55 percent. You have another um, 25 to 35 focusing on um, religion. You have another 15 wow. to 7 percent focusing on sports. Okay. 
and then you have about six percent focusing on development seriously yes is this ssa or includes north africa it's sub-saharan africa including wow. south africa then wow. what we did in the book was that we mapped that against china in its development cycle mm. just to see where we were in ours because you know the bible says that as a man thinketh, so is he mm. So what we found out was in China's development cycle, their media was so much focused on development. So you would go through a normal news broadcast and the conversation would be on a factory that had produced a one millionth tractor and it had improved by 36% efficiency. Mm. It could double the yield of acres plowed in maybe half the time, etc. And then they would show all the engineers that had worked on the project. I see. So you could see that the average Chinese person who's been, who's done their development in my lifetime, thinks on how to make things. And what I learned from that experience is that in reality, we haven't started yet focusing on our development as a continent. Oh, interesting. Yeah. We'll come back to this. Were you at the manifesto launch? I was. Did you, were you part of the team that put this together? Look, first of all, this manifesto was done by the people of Ghana for the people of Ghana. NDC practically facilitated it. And the, the chairman of the manifesto committee, the secretary, um, all the key members on the team mm. put in a lot of hard work and a lot of good work. His Excellency the President was also heavily involved in its composition. Mm. So what role did you play? This is, oh, we shared some ideas. Um, I think that's pretty much how much how our involvement was. We shared some ideas, we read through some of the mm. um, scripts and so on and so forth. It, it, I mean, it, it looks like a compendium of promises. <laughs> It is what the people of Ghana are asking for from their political leaders. Really? So that is what it is. Is that not the tail wagging the dog? Because if you have a developmental state like Ghana and you want to come and do what the people of Ghana say they want, so you list well, it's two things. Two thousand things you do for them and then they vote for you. It's is that how things. it is? It's not the tail wagging the dog. It's actually the head listening to the rest of the body, which is how it should be. Mm. Because if you want to lead a people, you must understand not only who they are, you must also understand where they are. And then you must have a vision that articulates of where we would all like to go and where we would all like to be. Mm. And that's what this manifesto en 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 cap uh, captures. Now, th there's, a, there's a lot of items and things in the manifesto. But the key, I think, within the manifesto is to look at where it came from. And I think our General Secretary, Asiyad Bin Ketia, made a very uh, interesting remark when he was delivering his speech at the manifesto launch, where he gave the example of how when the Fourth Republican Constitution was being written, His Excellency the President, uh, former President Rawlings, insisted that the Constitution be written by listening and consulting with the ordinary people and the mass people of this country. All the previous constitutions that had been written before didn't last three or four or five years, simply because it was done by intellectuals, people who, are, who have arrogated upon themselves the right to rule a country, mm. whereas the people also have their own idea. Now, also, it's also very important, Bernard, to make at this point that Ghana has evolved. Mm. We've gone from being a country of three million people to being a country of 30 million people. We've gone from a country where education penetration was probably about 6% to where it is um, above 60% today. So what you would do in the 60s, in the 70s, is not what you would do in the 90s and in the 20s, because more universities have been built, more mm. people have attended school. Most interestingly okay. today, there's social media. So you can have a Ghanaian living in some part of the country and he or she is able to understand what's happening within the rest of the world. So you've really got to approach the Ghanaian as if he's intelligent, mm. he's smart, and he or she knows what they want out of life. And that is what the People's Manifesto is about. Did the NDC um, explain to Ghanaians and admit 
the errors that led to Mr. Mohammed's defeat. I'm asking this because I, I, I watched you being interviewed in 2016. You seemed pretty <laughs> confident that Mahama was going to win. And because you, in fact, I remember the host of the show asking you a question that the MPP wanted to do something. And you said, oh, you had already started doing it. You said you already started, I think it was refining our crude or something. Yes. You sounded so confident. Yes. Somebody even say it was cocky. So confident that you were going to win. And then you quoted a scripture that said, oh, is it Mark 4, 23 or 3 something that a house of fire against us was not going to stand? Less than two months later, you lost by over a million votes. Yes, and it was a catastrophic experience for most of us. What does that say about your sense of reality well, at what, the time? What it says is that the party that is able to have the courage to walk into opposition is that same party is the party that is going to have the courage to walk back into government. Because opposition in my book is purgatory it's not hell you go back you <laughs> believe in purgatory oh i believe i'm a catholic oh, okay. born and raised <laughs> okay so you have a situation where the ndc had to go back and consider mm -hmm. what went wrong and the reality is that our party has always been based on listening to what the ordinary people of ghana want mm. and the result and the culmination of three and a half years in opposition is the people's manifesto. Some of your spokespersons have said the MPP promised their way into power. I mean charitable. Some of you say they lied their way into power. <laughs> Some of your people come on this show. Yes. So essentially saying that MPP just came to promise a compendium of things and they deceived gullible Ghanaians to vote for them. And you seem to be doing the same thing because you're promising a lot of things. In fact, even within education, you promise about four free things just in secondary. So I'm asking how different, if that premise is true, because you haven't even told me why you lost. If that premise is true, is this an attempt to give Ghanaian voters what they want so they just vote for you? No, it is not. Because what we've also learned is that it's very dangerous to overpromise and not deliver because the Ghanaian is intelligent. He's not stupid. Hmm. The challenge that the current government is having is the ability to have, I mean, it's almost four years hmm. and the people of Ghana are looking at what they said they were going to do and comparing it with what they have done. Mm -hmm. And that is a major challenge that you don't want to get in if you are in a party involved in national development. And the NDC has not done that. The NDC has gone to the people, we have listened to them, we have gone way back. I mean, this manifesto, um, I'll, give you, I'll give you an example. Remember His Excellency, the President, when he was delivering his opening remarks, yes. raised a number of issues. You are referring to the former President? The former President, uh, John John. Yes, okay, yes. just to be clear. Just to be clear. Yeah. He raised a couple of issues in his, in his introduction. He talked about poverty and how it is a scourge mm -hmm. and how it must be dealt with. He talked about Ghanaian ownership of the economy. Now, just to give you a bit of a background as to how far NDC went in our thinking, before we arrived at this. In the 70s and the 80s, when you smoked a cigarette, it was made in Ghana. When you went to a bank to borrow money, it was more than likely a Ghanaian bank, state bank. When you mined gold in this country, 75% of the gold mine was done by Ghanaian companies, i.e. the state gold mining company. When you sat on a plane, it was mostly Ghana Airways. So if you look at Ghanaian uh, contribution to the economy, or GNP as a percentage of GDP, it was over 70%, 71 to 72%. Ghana as a country has done three things since we went into the economic recovery program and the structural adjustment program. We have focused on macroeconomic stability. We have focused on that driven by foreign direct investment mm -hmm. and poverty alleviation programs. Macro stability. Macroeconomic stability. FDI. FDIs and poverty, poverty alleviation programs. programs. Every government from um, the PNDC all the way down to has had these issues strong in their... Yes, uh, that, 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 that is correct. Yes. The resultant effect of that is Ghanaian ownership of our economy today has fallen from that high of 72% to somewhere in the low 30s, uh, high 20s. So when you see a finance minister come and stand on TV and talk about how the economy is growing, and they always make a reference to GDP growth, we as Ghanaians don't feel it in our pockets. And it has created a certain breach of trust between the politicians and the people because you can't keep saying that this economy is growing 
and the average Ghanaian keeps getting squeezed and squeezed and squeezed out of the economy. The manifesto has raised some very key objectives mm. that we believe that as a matter of policy, we want to have Ghanaian ownership of the economy grow to about 55%. Because if you don't achieve that, then you are looking at a national security issue because the problem of this country is poverty. Now, Paul, uh, uh, this, is key for, this is key for me to explain. I was driving around the country in the last year and a half since I've been back, and I've engaged with many people. And one of the things that I've heard people say, in fact, I don't know if your producer can get it up, but there was a picture of me and some engagements I had. There's this woman I met in a town in the Afran Plains. You went to Afran Plains? I went to the Afran Plains. And they were telling me that... To do what? Was this a tour as a... Because you're a businessman, or what, are you, are you campaigning, what were you doing, just to be sure? I was doing both. I was listening to Ghanaians, and I was monitoring is, them. Is it a woman? Yes, that, those are the people, yes. You were interviewing her yourself? No, we were doing a under the tree palaver discussion about the situation that they face. Wow. These two women, or these two ladies are saying that mm -hmm. they are tired of being poor. Mm -hmm. They burn charcoal, and that is how they make their living. And so when we were talking to them about uh, free SHS, etc., etc., they like it, but they also want to be wealthy. They want to have a decent life. So the issues of what governments have been doing with regard to focusing on poverty alleviation, you can do that when you are 3 million people. You can do that when you are 6 million people. At 30 million people, if 60% of your population and thereabouts is poor, there is no amount of revenue you can generate to but, manage their poverty. But two, two things. Mm -hmm. The MPP has implemented pro-poor policies under Kufo. They introduced the capitation grant, mm -hmm. which improve access at the basic level to education mm -hmm. he also introduced school feeding program correct where because of poverty parents who used to send their kids to farm send their kids to school correct saw the report yes and akufado has introduced free shs yes these are pro poor policies yes. which even ideologically are supposed to be done by your party <laughs> yes so if you come and tell me that there's poverty in the country and in our fourth republic NDC has been in power for a longer time. MPP has had eight years plus three. You've had 92 to 2000. No, NDC. Yes. Not PNDC. NDC and the PNDC yes. are two different entities. Yes. And they ruled under yes, two different... Yes, 93 to 2000 NDC. Yes, right. correct. And then you also did Mills Mahama. Correct. So you've done two eight-year terms, 16 years. So you're going to tell me that poverty... You see, it's a good... What it's are you good, saying? It's a good question. And... One of the things that I want to say about this manifesto, every era has its issue and has its challenges. Mm. So, for example, in 2012, the defining mm. issue was power. Mm. So a lot of the government then's effort went into uh, solving the power crisis. Mm -hmm. If you came to 2017, there was no power crisis. So the government of uh, President Akufuado has not had to be de fo focus on that. The point is, this manifesto is focusing on where we are as a country in this point in time. Now, I'm going to come actually back to the question that you're asking about what is this about poverty. Mm -hmm. Ghana has transitioned from a planned economy to a mixed economy into a free market economy. Mm -hmm. In a free market economy, you need five things. And it is these five things go into what is referred to as an enabling environment. Mm -hmm. So when governments and politicians say our job is not to create jobs, but to create an enabling environment. Yeah. We're talking about five things. Mm -hmm. Number one is human capital. So every government in this country has focused on human capital, which is primarily education, knowledge, training, and skills. Mm -hmm. The second is social capital, which is who you know or who knows you. It's a very legitimate form of capital because that is what gives people access mm. to ideas to, uh, 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 to, and to opportunities. The third form of capital is your natural resource capital. Ghana and Ghanaians are endowed with tons and tons of that natural resource capital. Mm -hmm. Our lakes, our rivers, Good. our land, our ocean for fishing and all of that. Good. The fourth one is your environmental capital, which, you, which is loosely translated as the opportunities available to you. Mm -hmm. So if you look at a guy like a company called Coco King, 
Yes. Came, looked at the Ghanaian environment, realized that it had moved on. A lot of small families um, rushing to work in the morning with the kids going to mm -hmm. school may not have time because they live very far to make breakfast. So he started, he saw an, an opportunity in an economic environment and he created a business out of that. Mm -hmm. The fifth one is financial capital. Mm. And that is where our country has not been able to deliver for our citizens. And if you look at capital, how Ghanaians have formed capital in the last 30 or so odd years, it's been primarily in three ways. The most, imp the most uh, common way have been people leaving the country at the age of 20 or 25 migrate to Europe or America and they spend the first five years settling down, getting their papers <laughs> and all of that. Interesting. Then they spend another five years settling down, having a family and kids. They come and buy a piece of land in Ghana. So that's 10 years. He's managed to acquire a piece of land. Then he spends another five years. He'll probably build a house up to Linto. That's 15 years. If he was 25 years old, he's now uh, 40 years old okay mm. then he spends another five years to finish the house and probably buy um, some furnishings and so on and so forth that's 20 years and the gentleman or the family would now spend the last five years moving back to ghana they would have decided the business they want to do mm. they would have bought the cars they want to live in and all of that so the average ghanaian has been taking 20 to 25 years to get what is called capital to be able to um, live their dreams. This is financial capital. Financial capital. Because they would have developed their human capital and all those other skills. So if you are trying to develop an economy, you cannot develop the country with schools are good, the hospitals are good, the roads are good. But when a man has an idea and he can't have an environment within which he finances those ideas, then he becomes he or she becomes frustrated so if you listen to all the young people in ghana today mm. the shout is for jobs and for opportunity because if our state cannot provide a certain environment now let's go back to the so-called good old days of ghanaian entrepreneurs and capitalism you talk about the jkc and the bmn says the kwabnao Wusus, and so on and so forth they had nib they had adb they had a merchant bank. They had state-owned institutions that were ready to support Ghanaian um, individuals with capital and long-term capital to be able to grow their businesses. So what is the NDC's uh, let me plan based on the manifesto? I will come to, to that. To, we don't have all day. I just want to be sure. I, you've built a point. Okay. Capital within, formation is within the manifesto, a difficult problem. I think on page 30F, um, Mm -hmm. we, we talk about the banking crisis because the banking crisis and I have to put that in, the, in this context mm -hmm. the banking crisis has affected the Ghanaian banks within the SME space that lend to Ghanaians okay so if you're a Ghanaian businessman before and you're a Ghanaian businessman today there's a huge difference in terms of your opportunity to access capital and you can see that in the drop in volume of the business of ports uh, activity at the port and so on and so forth and it started way back in 2018 it wasn't a function of really? COVID. yes lending to Ghanaian lending has not been I, I, the, the issue of lending to private sector from the banks predates the COVID. -o. It's always been an issue. No, but that's the point I'm making. I'm only talking about the SMEs. Okay. Who are not, I mean, that's what I'm saying. The Ghanaians, the small Ghanaian middle class that we had was playing within the indigenous Ghanaian banking sector uh -huh. because the multinational banks lend to multinationals. Yeah. They don't lend to Ghanaians. And obviously, they are using Ghanaian deposits to lend to foreign companies. That's mm. been one of the features of our economy because. Yeah, apart from the capital is your deposits that you use to actually do business so you have a situation today where NDC has made has recognized that MFI's savings and loans um, indigenous banks have been pushed out of the system and therefore the average Ghanaian is struggling to access capital I was watching the news when I came here today and I saw this struggle between the Nigerian traders and, and mm -hmm. Ghanaian traders. 
the major, one of the major causes underlying that is very simple. In the 2000s, we brought in a lot of Nigerian banks into the Ghanaian economy. And that was a good thing because it's good to diversify your financial sector service base. But the minute the Ghanaian traders fell out, the Ghanaian banking system, indigenous banking system fell out, you see that the Nigerian traders, by virtue of their links, for example, uh, and I'll give you an example. An uncle doing business in nails, selling in Sokoto. He's doing 100 containers a month because of the size of the Nigerian economy. He has a nephew and he says, go to Ghana and start a business. He goes to UBA Bank mm -hmm. and guarantees that nephew at UBA Bank with his balance sheet and his business in Nigeria. That gentleman comes to Ghana. He has access to capital and he's, he's now able to trade. The Ghanaian businessman who was doing business with UT Bank or uh, Unibank or some other bank, all of a sudden has a credit squeeze. So in terms of the ability of to do business, even though the gentleman from Nigeria is not necessarily within Ghana, he has a bigger advantage. But the public no, sector involvement in our banking sector has increased. So even though seven banks sort of disappeared into... The first two became a bigger GCB. There's now consolidated as well. There's ADB still there. There's NIB still there. So you have four state-controlled banks. You are saying you want to build a regional development finance institution, yes. presumably state-owned, right? But you already have GCB. You have... There are two things there. GCB and the regular commercial banks. ADB, NIB, ADB, all of them. Consolidated banks. They are operating as universal banks. Uh -huh. Universal banks run on Basel II. Mm -hmm. Okay? Basel as a banking regulatory system has many features and many factors, but I'll just talk about two of them. One, it was designed for industrialized societies, which have just-in-time stocks. Mm. Um, and therefore, their cash conversion cycles are... 90 days, maybe 180 days. Uh -huh. They also were designed to give European countries and Western industrialized countries an average of 3 to 5% growth. Okay? Now, Ghana is an agrarian society. If it's cocoa that you are going to plant, it takes three years before you can get your first harvest. That is why there are no uh, universal banks financing agriculture because the structure of the regulation within which they sit does not allow them to invest in development. Before that, we had developmental banking mm -hmm. in our banking regulation mm -hmm. until I think it was in 2004 mm -hmm. uh, where the Kufour administration created a universal banking uh, regulation. Mm -hmm. And that is what has created the situation where we realize that we need Institutions that are focused at development finance. But MPB promised a development bank, and I think they gave an update in their manifesto. Look, the, the, I think the plan was to merge NIB and ADB. First of all, to have a development bank, you need to have a regulation for that. There's no regulation for that. In their manifesto, they are pursuing the normal universal banking approach. But if you want to have development financial institutions, you have to have Bank of Ghana focus on a different style of regulation. The NDC set up the Exim Bank, mm -hmm. and that was supposed to finance uh, export-oriented uh, type of activities. Mm -hmm. But if you go back into our history, what we are saying is not new. It's been done before. I'm sure you remember Voradep, Norip, Redikash, Eredek. Mm -hmm. Voradep is the Volta Regional Development Corporation. Uh, Redikash is the Regional Development Corporation of Ashanti. Mm -hmm. Eredek is the Eastern Regional uh, mm -hmm. development company. I know Varada Football Club and Eredek Hotel. <laughs> so but I'm sure they are from the same source. So at the time, you didn't have many Ghanaians that were entrepreneurial. So government decided they would focus on development, uh, um, development, focus on development on a regional specific basis. Mm -hmm. Because there are certain, for example, crops like, cash, uh, like cashew or like uh, shea which are indigenous to different parts of the country versus cocoa, mm. you know. Now, if you want to focus on how you build this country, you've got to be able to get access to credit, give your citizens access to credit 
in the regions in where they live and the opportunities. Which is why you are, you are thinking about a regional development on a regional basis. I'll take a break and come back and es explore that. I want to okay. talk about industrialization because um, Mr. Wadaku seems to think that he has, or the NDC has a plan to industrialize, which will be better than the 1D1F, which we are told has uh, spawned almost 100 factories. This is the point of view. We're chatting to Kwame Wadaku, former boss and tour. I'm just not ready yet. I want to wait a little before getting pregnant again. Stop worrying and live free. No matter who you are, Lydia has a contraceptive just for you. with iron as your regular contraceptive or the Lydia IUD and and stray cats. If you sent a worker to go into the tank farm, they were refusing to go. We couldn't pay for electricity and our lights were being shut off uh, all the time. You will also remember that things were so bad that the workers of Tor gave up their salaries for two months to enable us uh, put the company's uh, finances in a short term together. That is the tour I went to meet. Really? The tour I left had gone from 25,000 barrels a day to 45,000 barrels a day. Tor had paid off, we had restructured 350 million out of the 650 million tour debt that I went to meet. Um, we had, in, we were started processing 10 crude oil. Really? And yes, we had, and I mean, it was. But you took over tour July 2015. Correct. Having done boss from October 2013. I have the state ownership report for 2017. Mm -hmm. Revenue for tour 2015, 257 million. Actually
2016, 2048, and in 2017, 2012, net profit, loss of 470 million 2015, loss of 511 million 2016, yeah. loss of 365 2017. So the first thing you've got to realize is 2015, I had six months to get the mindset of the workers and to refocus the organization. So we did an organizational restructuring and, and all that. We started refining on the 4th of February 2016. Now, we had a model where Tor was tolling for crude oil for Bost. Mm. And as a result of that, um, the, there was, the, it was, Tor wasn't engaged in a commercial operation on the crude oil trading. It was just focusing on the processing. Mm. Tor was making $4.5 every barrel, and we tolled 7 million barrels. That was nice, clean income with no price fluctuation or exposure to thermal oil refinery. So if you look at that, it was the first time that Thor had stable income for a period. Now, when you see the uh, net figure you are talking about, you should go and look at the top line to see the operational income. Because on an operational basis, we made a profit. But if you've inherited debts, if you've inherited a huge hole, that profit goes under the bottom line to create, um, that's where you see that the losses were falling, but focus on the top line, which is where my own activities... But I'm just saying, even the revenue dipped from 2015 to 2016, revenue came down. So for a company that hasn't refined and you're refining, revenue is top I, of the top line. I will, I will challenge the... It's here. I will challenge that. I have it here. This is your state ownership report. 2015, uh, 257 million. 2016, 248 million. 2017, 212 million. I doubt those figures. Well, this is your state ownership report, page 55. You can check it, unless will, they made a mistake. I, I will go and check, but I doubt those figures. I know what we did and what we left behind. So what was your revenue for 2016? Um, Tor's revenue for 2016 would be... Um, it would be... About 45 million. This is in series, by the way. I think we had an exchange rate of about four. Five million dollars. Yeah, 45. No, actually, it's more than that. Yeah, it's about five million dollars. Yeah. 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 Four, five, twenty. There you are. Seven, two, four, eight. Eight, 2017 is the look I wasn't at responsible. Mm. But you left in end of 20. Yes. So end of year. So you yeah. have resolved for 2015-2016. Yeah. And revenue was coming down. Well, it was real cash. It was real revenue. It was real income. I don't know As what... against what? There's so many ways. Look, that company's debt overhang when I walked in was about $650 million. I don't know what debt position you have over there. Uh, in total liabilities, $2.8 billion. Mm -hmm. In 2016, $3.3 billion. Nah, 2017, $2.4 billion. 2015, yeah. comes down to $1.9 billion. Yeah. So what's happening to Tor now? I have no idea. I saw an article in the newspaper. You have no idea. You used to run Tor for <laughs> You have no idea. You know, there's a tradition in How? Tor. Okay. Every, there's no managing director in Tor who has left, who has actually ever returned back to the refinery. Why? It's a tradition. But you, are, you should be interested. You're talking about poverty alleviation. You're here saying NDC wants to do this and that and the other. You, you don't what, even know what what's happening to Tor. I know they are not refining. That's, the, that's number one. I know they've tried to refine a few times, and wow. they've made some losses, but I don't know the details, so I don't want to... Is it because there were allegations of some kind against you when you left? No, no. What's the, stat are you, have you, have, what's the status of, of that? Look, I had, I don't know, Canadian Japan was saying that uh, $300 million is missing in Bost, $200 million had been traced to an account of mine. I sued him. I think we're still in court for that. I haven't been charged with any theft or anything of that nature. What's the status of the suit? 
Um, honestly speaking, I haven't been aggressively following it because... Was you seen it for 5 million CDs? Yes, I did. If I see somebody <laughs> for 5 million, I'll be, I'll be following him. Oh, oh. You, don't, you don't need the money. I, I'm not driven by money. Now, if somebody's damaged your reputation and you sued him, you should... I think for it. me, most important is for that right to be... That wrong to be put right. Have you been cleared? Have I been cleared of what? Of allegations made against you. Well, allegations are not uh, charges. So if you, if you make an allegation against somebody, basically I have not been, I've gone through a process and I know I don't have any outstanding issues with any of the authorities in the country. Okay. Yeah. So Yoko hasn't written to you to say they're investigating you or anything like this? Oh, Yoko did investigate me. But they have finished their investigation. And did they show you the final report? I have seen it, yes. And what does the report say about you? People to answer what that says. There are no processes after that. No. So your assumption is that okay. No, I read the report. And what did he say? I'm fine. <laughs> Development Bank, I wanted to read something to you. You said you want to do, this is page 30, right? Yes. You, re, you said that uh, one of the things NDC would do, where is page 30? We'll uh, focus on getting capital to regional development finance institutions or banks. It's to not the credit. only mechanism. There's the mass I wanted like to, to show you something. Yeah. The uh, National Development Bank, I'm told there's already a bill passed on this. Yes, there is, yes. It's in Parliament. I don't know if it's been passed. So that's what I'm asking. So is N N your, 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 the difference are yours is regional. Look, NDC MPP has an idea. Um, you can read what they've said there. But yeah, you can read it. Then National Development Bank is expected to be an 